Thank you all for joining us. And tonight I want us all to come to what is right. And in that spirit, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture surrounding us for this evening. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Before we begin the second part of tonight's proceedings, I want to pay tribute to Dr. Jean Sherman A.M. and Brian Sherman A.M., whose tireless work in the realms of philanthropy and the arts, in addition to law and human and animal rights advocacy, has contributed to our daily lives in ways both measurable and enduring. I want to recognize Jean Sherman's vision for the foundation, to which myself, Timothy Nicol Ford, Sairi Yoshizawa, Katie Louise Ford, Daisy Tiskevich, Victoria Brewster, which is the Sky Team, are privileged to contribute. This vision follows Jean's trajectory in the worlds of arts, design, and architecture to create a program embracing opportunities to dream, to grow, to improve, and ultimately to be brave. Sky's curatorial vision then has been necessarily broad. We've investigated how architecture is shaped by commerce, how it shapes the mind of a child, how it recognizes our ecological reality doesn't, how it forms the delivery of justice, in short, how our impulse to build and create architecture expresses both our hopes and our struggles of becoming. Sky Architecture finds the very best to exhibit in this way, but we also believe it is important to find the very worst to exhibit, to hold examples of evil up to the highest standards of scrutiny, and tonight I ask this of you. I ask us all to be brave. We have a lot of work to do. On July 19, 2013, then PM Kevin Rudd released a statement to the press on the PNG solution. I quote, We are a compassionate nation and we will continue to deliver a strong humanitarian program. On July 23rd, no less than four days later, this strong humanitarian program sent six guards into the sleeping quarters of a compound on Christmas Island. I quote from the testimony of one of their wards. Within a few minutes, they took us to a tightly confined cage. The silence injects one with a heavy despair, the kind of despair associated with diaspora, a despair associated with exile. It's hard being imprisoned, being locked in a cage. The line is left unfinished. These are the words of MPG45. They're a damning indictment of architecture. And, as we are in courtroom at present, these words should also be considered our arraignment. In recent years, we've come to recognize the voice of MPG45 as that of Beirut Bouchani, who in 2013 reached Christmas Island after surviving his second treacherous world journey, just four days after Rudd introduced the Manus and policies. He is a journalist, a poet, a human rights defender, a filmmaker, an associate professor at the University of New South Wales and Burbank University of London. In Iran, he was awarded a master's degree in political science, political geography, and geopolitics. And from these perspectives, Mr. Bouchani tapped out the memoir, No Friend But the Mountains, writing from Manus Prison, in a series of phone messages to tell the story of being detained for six years on Manus Island, under the surveilling gaze of this self-professedly compassionate nation. His memoir has subsequently been awarded many of Australia's richest literary prizes, its author is yet to be awarded a sign. Beirut Bachani remains in offshore detention and speaks to us tonight via a live video link. He is joined by Julian Burnside, AOQC, a highly respected barrister and one of Australia's most vocal human rights and refugee advocates, whose tireless honesty has helped change public attitudes and refocus the value of human rights in our treatment of the world's most vulnerable. Jean, myself, and the Foundation thank them both for their compassion and their bravery. Tonight, we are being broadcast live to the University of Technology, Sydney, our principal education partner. I wish to thank every student and academic in attendance there. I also wish to thank the generosity of so many individuals who have helped make this evening possible. Andy Lyle and Tim Barker of Technical Event Services, up there. Hannah Memory and Sarah Valley of Pan Macmillan. Ben Stroud, Sky's senior consultant and former CEO of the Biennale of Sydney and executive director of the Sydney Writers Festival. Dollar Merrilies, our esteemed Sky Global Emissary and the Architecture Hub moderator at large. And Adam.
Adam Lindsay, Director and Joni Taylor of Sydney Living Museums. Please welcome Julian Burnside, AOQC, and let's give Ailes Bachani the welcome to Australia he ought to already have. I was 
not only a novelist on that time. I was working as a human rights defender. I was working as a, a journalist. And in other side, I was a detainee. I was a prisoner. And I had to endure the hardship of the prison, you know, of the, of the living in that prison camp. So, the, for example, I had to stay in the line to get an orange for two hours, for an hour, you know. So, uh, it was uh, an injured the systematic torture of that, uh, you know, uh, system. So, that's why it was really hard and my body damaged uh, seriously. Uh, um, but uh, I lost uh, too much weight on that time. But uh, I'm happy that finally, you know, uh, this all of these text messages uh, yeah, became a book, and Australian people are able to read this book and uh, understand more about uh, life inside the prison camp. Of course, now your English is pretty good. When you were writing the book, you wrote it in Farsi, I think. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, when I write my journalism work, I write it in Farsi because my translator is uh, the, the Persian, and also, uh, you know, I don't want to struggle to find a word to write, and I think uh, it's better I don't reduce because of lack of English. So that's why I prefer to uh, write in uh, Farsi uh, or sometimes in Kurdish and translate it to English. Yeah. But uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, language is important. And your, inter your translator, Omid Tofigian, did a terrific job. It, it, is, it, it reads very well in English. Yeah, 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 it was very good and I think I was lucky that I, the Omid made contact with me four years ago. Before that, I was working with another translator, Munes Mansudi, so she translated many of my articles. But when uh, Omid uh, made contact with me through one of the articles that I published in Guardian, yeah, we became friends and so, yeah, we started to work together and still we are working together and uh, I never called him as a translator. We are like, not like, we are connected. Yeah. Um, I, I want to take you through some of the steps of the journey that brought you from uh, where you came from to where you are now. Starting with Christmas Island, can you tell us please what Christmas Island was like? Yeah, I'm really sorry. Someone called me, so when someone called me, I should join the meeting again. So this 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just 30 seconds, I will join the meeting. <laughs> Christmas Island were like? 
Yeah, so Christmas Island, I was there for a short time, for about a month. Uh, so it was a real prison. And uh, sometimes I think that Christmas Island uh, was worse than man's in uh, some ways. You know, this session is about the, uh, you know, architecture. And I think Christmas Island was very, uh, with a very complicated uh, architecture and also very modern. Uh, and the building there, uh, you know, I describe this, you know, uh, in my book, uh, describe the architecture. Uh, you know, in Christmas Island, was a place that you uh, feel, uh, you know, it was different because there was not uh, any element of, uh, you know, any natural element in that place, you know. So everywhere was, uh, you know, just building with many cages and many rules. But in Manus, we were uh, lucky because, of course, the situation was worse than Christmas Island, but uh, we were lucky because we were uh, the place the prison camp was located in a, you know, a very uh, tropical uh, area, and so we could hear the voice of uh, ocean, we could see the ocean, and we could uh, you know, uh, see the birds uh, and the natural elements. I think that is important because the element, the natural elements always help you to, you know, injure the prison, you know. In Christmas Island was different. So I can describe this later, that how this system used the architecture as the tools for torture people, you know. But we were lucky because we had the, we were uh, located. The the guards on Christmas, the, Christ, the guards yeah. on Christmas Island were pretty tough, and you were strip searched a number of times on Christmas Island, weren't you? Yeah. So in Christmas Island. I think the system was more complex, and that's why it was dangerous. For uh, and sometimes I think how in Christmas Island perhaps we couldn't enjoy uh, that place because everywhere was you know we were surrounded by uh, metals, you know, and there was not any. Identity elements in the place, you know, uh, particularly the natural elements. So, and also we were in a very high uh, security place on that time. Uh, they always search our bodies. They, uh, you know, there was a law, a rule that we had to sleep at 10 o'clock that night, and they turn off the lights. Uh, we had to stay in the long queues, uh, and so we didn't have uh, this, uh, you know, we were not allowed to uh, of soccer or this kind of things, you know, the games. So it was horrible, and uh, sometimes I think, you know, we couldn't survive in uh, Christmas Island because uh, you know, they were, they designed the system to destroy us, you know. They deliberately were uh, going to destroy us and the system was designed to take our identity, you know, to take uh, our humanity and just put us through, a, a, you know, competition with others for getting simple things. I describe this in the book. Uh, so, you know, I would like to ask everyone to read the book and uh, was, uh, you know, 
people cannot understand this system through journalism always. In, in the book, you ex you describe being taken to the airport on Christmas Island, about to be deported to Manus, and um, in it you talk about the massive journalists who came along, taking photographs and so on, and you say they are completely mesmerised by the government's dirty politics and just follow along. The deal is that we have to be a warning, a lesson for people who want to seek protection in Australia. Uh, now, is it accurate to say that you and your colleagues who were on, who were taking the matters, felt as though you were being made an example of to deter other people from seeking asylum in Australia? Yeah, you know, on that time I was thinking like this, that uh, they keep us here, and actually I published uh, some articles about this, that they uh, exile us to Manus Island just to send a message to the, uh, you know, people in, uh, you know, war zones that won't come to Australia. If you come, we will uh, send you to, we will exile you with the uh, Manus and Naro, and we torture you there. I think it is wrong, and I was wrong. Uh, the main reason, this government never wanted to, you know, solve this problem, you know. They just sent us there for different reasons, you know. The main reason is that they could uh, manipulate Australian people through this uh, exile policy and put Labour Party in a defensive uh, position. And now, after six years, we can see that they, uh, you know, won two federal elections, although the last election they were going to use us, but they didn't because of the Christchurch, uh, you know, terrorist attack. But they uh, always uh, put labor in a defensive uh, position. And now we can see that they, uh, the labor, the in other, uh, you know, subjects, other issues. And, you know, so Labour is not a real opposition now, you know. I think that started by uh, this exile policy. That, and uh, so that was the main reason, because of political benefits. The second reason was because of, uh, you know, corruption, you know. They spent nine billion dollars. Where is this money? You know, and there is not a system in Australia to investigate this. And where is this money? You know, and the third reason is the ideological reason. Just they are happy. You know, they are this uh, policy became like a sadistic, uh, you know, policy, and they just enjoy. You know, they enjoy to torture people. So that's why I am sure that uh, they are not, uh, they never want uh, to solve this problem. Now, you know, um, 880 people accepted by America, but they don't send them to America. Just uh, wasting time. Why? Because they don't want to solve this problem. You know, if they wanted to solve this problem, they could solve this problem six years ago or five years ago. But after six years, still they are using this. So that's why, you know, of course, on that time I was completely wrong. So uh, what has happened to the people who've been accepted by America? Have they gone there? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so far 300 people uh, resettled in America. And now about uh, 80 people accepted so they are waiting that they send them and about 30 people are waiting to get result and these people finished their process three years ago or two years ago but still they have the result but still they refuse to give the result to them you know so if they really want to send people to america i think uh, 100 people will transfer to america so you can say that 400 people from uh, Manus. But of course, I'm in uh, touch with some of them. So many of them face uh, many problems.
problems because uh, you know they were traumatized and they survived uh, in a very you know hard prison and a very hard and you know actually the worst uh, place. Uh, so they are facing, but you know, I, I think it will take time. So hopefully they, you know, survive in America, you know, but uh, of course they are working and they are like other citizens, you know, and they are paying tax. They are like others. And you and I are both aware of people who've been sent to America, even though they have wives and children living in Australia. Yes, yeah, so now I think uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, some problems here, which is some of these guys who are in America, they left their children in Manus because there are uh, many, actually more than 30 refugees have wives in Manus, local wives, and so they have to leave the families, so there is not any mechanism that all oh, these people can take their children to America. And now, this place that I'm living, there is a man that he has a child, so he was about to fly to America, but he refused because his son was sick, and that's why he prefer to stay here, but there is not, uh, you know, the option for him, and we don't know how uh, this system is going to deal with these cases. So he stay here and he's living in poverty because Port Moresby is very different with Manus. In Manus, we were living in a community, so they gave us about. Uh, Three, 100 kina, which is about 40 Syrian dollars per week. But in, uh, it was enough, not enough, but it was okay that people, you know, buy cigarettes or so on. But in Port Mosby, really, uh, it's very expensive city and people are living in poverty, you know. Uh, the so it is the, so I don't know you know, how this man and other people who have wives survive in this city, you know, but they are living in poverty. So there is not uh, any option for these people. In particular, I was thinking about a man who we talked about before, who has a wife and children living in Australia, but he was not allowed to go to yeah. Australia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there are some cases like this, that people have, uh, you know, Australian wife and even children. So I don't know what will happen for these people, but uh, some of them transfer to Australia on the Medivac law. So yeah, I think they are not uh, violating, uh, the, you know, our human rights. They are doing this towards the Australian citizens because just imagine an Australian woman that she has a wife, she fell in love with the refugee here. So, of course, it is her right to take her husband to Australia. You know? Well, that, that, assume, that assumes that our government is being honest when it says it values family values. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so, since you mentioned Medivac, can I ask you what is the state of health of the people who remain <coughs> in PMG at the moment? The people who were on Manus, the people who are now in Port Moresby. How's their health? Yeah, you know, right now we are 300 people. Before, two years ago, we were 900 people. So now we are 300 people or 320. And uh, what we are very concerned about uh, 52 people who are uh, in prison in uh, the Bomana prison camp. Not camp, prison jail, you know, the Bomana jail. So they keep 50 people there. Uh, 
today, for the first time, after two months, for the first time I met with uh, one of them who just released because he wanted to go back to his country. So I met with him. Uh, he shared some information, you know, it was terrible. He said that uh, there is not medical treatment there and people, uh, many people self harm in that prison and they are starving. They don't give them you know, enough food. And he said that all of people lost their, their, you know, more than 10 kilos, you know. This man that I met, I was in shock when I met him because he was a very strong man with a strong body. But today that I met with him, he was, you know, he lost uh, weight and, you know, it was very, you know, really, I was in shock. So right now, the main concern is about those people who are in the Bomana prison and they accept, they already accepted by Medivac, some of them, you know, special Ben on Saka, who is the witness for. Uh, but they don't let them to, you know, fly to uh, Australia to get medical treatment. So the main problem right now is this. And another thing is that people feel forgotten. They feel that they left them here without protection. And so that's why the main problem is that people are struggling with uh, mental uh, problems, you know, they are mentally sick. Now, you, you mentioned Benham Sata a moment ago as one of the people in, in Bamana. Um, yeah. Benham, Benham Sata was the person who spoke out and told the truth about how Reza Barati was killed. Um, yeah. uh, can you tell the audience here um, how Reza Barati was killed and what Benham Sata's role was? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Benham uh, is uh, always is an important person for uh, refugees in PNG. Uh, you know, people didn't hear about him too much, but he is a true human rights defender. He has worked a lot over the past six years. He, you know, uh, so on that time that Reza Balati was killed, I was in Fox Road, the prison camp, and I was not, but Reza was in, uh, the, you know, in another camp, uh, in my prison camp. So I was not there to see, but uh, Benham was there with some of uh, other people, about three people. So Benham role, was that he, the, when Reza Barati killed by the system, uh, Scott Morrison was the immigration minister on that time. And this man just appeared on TV and he says that Reza Barati was killed by the local people because he wanted to go to the community and he said something very wrong and you know, disgusting, you know. So the Benham was a person that he uh, was not silent, you know. He just uh, stand up against this system and he started to speak out. And he started and then Scott Morrison apologized for that. He said, I made a mistake, you know. So I think uh, the role of uh, Benham Sata was important because he didn't let the system and uh, to, you know, hide the truth. And that's why, you know, he did many interviews on that time. And when we say that, we should return to that time. And that time was not easy to speak out, you know. Right now, we are talking about this after six years, you know. And we created so much challenge to, towards this system. You know, even I myself, I was working 
as an unknown person for two years because I didn't feel, feel safe with the authorities, you know. Anytime, they, on that time, no one here, the whole man was, it was very dangerous. So, uh, Ben of Sata started to speak out, and I think it's very important, and he put himself in danger because uh, those people were treating him, you know, the killers. And what was important for Benham that, uh, you know, the, they send uh, the killers to the prison and they, uh, you know, the court uh, ordered that they should be in prison for four years, you know. They were two people, two local people. But Benham, uh, you know, started to speak out and he said that two Australian officers and a New Zealand uh, New Zealander officer were among the killers and they uh, the system uh, transferred those people to Australia and now you know they are free and they never they never send them back to uh, PNG to court but I think it was very important because he didn't let uh, the system go higher. That's so cool. <laughs> um, a as you point out, Reza Barati was killed by G4S guards on the Australian yeah. Bay Roll. And um, Scott Morrison, carelessly or dishonestly, said that he had, had escaped from the camp and was killed by locals. That's what the story was. Benham Sandow, Benham Sandow's role was he was a roommate with Reza Barati. He saw what happened. He saw Reza Barati being killed and he wrote an affidavit explaining what he had seen, telling the truth about what had happened. And for his trouble, he was then taken into the G4S office, was tied to a chair and was beaten up by G4S guards who told him that unless he withdrew his affidavit, he himself would be taken outside the camp where he would be raped by locals. And yeah. as you say, he refused to withdraw his statement. And as a result, we learned um, through the honesty of Benham Sattar, we learned that what Scott Morrison had said was not accurate. And um, Benham Sattar has suffered as a result of telling the truth. Yeah. And now, what's happened for him? He was accepted by Medivac, so he was ready that they transferred him to Australia in two days, you know. Even he called me and he said uh, goodbye, you know. He said goodbye, I'm leaving in the next few days, you know, everything was ready. Then they came and arrested him and put him in Bomanana and not be woman up for more than two months. So I think it is a very sad story. But, uh, you know, I am in touch with his brother and I am in touch with some of the families. Uh, so for these people, it's really hard. Sometimes I don't know what should I say to the families, you know. Now, as so you they are, as you probably know, the Australian government is trying to repeal the Medivac legislation. Um, the legislation would otherwise bring Benham Satara and others here. One of the arguments uh, in support of repealing the Medivac legislation is that our Minister of Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, forgive me for saying that name, um, <laughs> has said that um, an unknown number of people uh, who might be many back to Australia are criminals, <laughs> including murderers, terrorists, and rapists. Are you aware of any of the people who are presently held in Papua New Guinea who are criminals of any sort? Yeah, I think uh, we should say that the main criminal is Peter Dutton, you know, <laughs> and the main terrorist is Peter Dutton, <laughs> and because you know, there are evidence and documents that there is not uh, justice in this world. That's why 
he is free now, you know. And Australia is not the real liberal democracy. That's why he is free now. So the main criminal is him. Uh, second thing I would like to say that, you know, uh, all of people here are free now. Uh, of course, we are a community. We were 900 people two years ago. And uh, I think it is natural that in any community, uh, you know, sometimes the, you know, people do some crime. But in Manus, you know, we were 900 people. And now everyone are free of any court and no have any court case here. Just two people are in uh, Manus, so they already, uh, you know, the court order against them and they are in prison. So they transfer them to Port Cosby. So we have only two people here that who are facing uh, charge, you know. Uh, but other people, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, I think he's completely uh, lying because you know, everyone are free here, you know, I mean, free of the, any court. And so, I don't know why he said that. Uh, I think perhaps because of the election, he said that before the election many times. If you remember on that time that Scott Morrison went to Christmas Island and he started the scare campaign there, they said that. But now, uh, I, I, I didn't hear from them yet for a long time. So, because they are lying. And they were, when the reporter asked them, they refused to mention the, you know, particular cases. Just they said something, you know, in general. And I think, so, they are lying. You know, if they are right, they should show the, they give the evidence. So that's why, you know, of course, they are lying. And the whole system, the whole exile policy designed by um, secrecy, you know. You know, you as an Australian citizen, can you get uh, information and what the Australian media can get, uh, are allowed to get uh, information about this $9 billion that they wasted in months and now. You know, the whole this system, and when you say that, when you ask them, they say it is because of national security. So that's why we don't share the information. And they don't share the information about the number of the boats that, uh, you know, came to Australia. And so, uh, uh, of course, they, you know, uh, the whole this policy in base of lying. But, you know, just one thing I would like to mention is that, you know, years ago, and many times, you know, I as a person who experienced this dictatorship system, you know, I was born as a poor. I was, uh, you know, I grew up in a dictatorship system, a religious dictatorship system, and I know what is the dictatorship means, you know. Yes, and I left my country because of that, you know. What's happened in Manus and Naro was a completely a dictatorship system towards the refugees. And now, after years and years, we can see that Peter Dutton is running Australia as a camp state, you know. He attacked the, uh, protesters in Australia, they, they, he accused them, those people who are, you know, protesting for, you know, climate change, the people with disability and uh, the Aboriginal people, you can see, you know, and even his rebel, you know, in, during the election, that he used a very, you know, disgust, you know, word to that lady from, you know, labor opposition, I forgot her name, you know, during the election campaign. Why? Because he and his party practiced dictatorship for years and years in Manus and Naro, and now this 
dictatorship, you know, they expanded and spread this dictatorship towards other part of the Australia. You know, it is a big mistake by the Australian people, and uh, you know uh, that think that Manus and Naro are not a part of Australia. Of course, we are a part of Australia. You know, you know this violence created by the Australia, and Australia has practiced this kind of you know barbaric uh, acts and crimes against humanity in Manus and Naro for years and years, and of course that uh, negatively impacted on uh, Australian political, uh, you know, uh, culture and structure. So that's why I think it's very important for Australian people to recognize this, that this dictatorship that practiced in Australia now is, you know, uh, treating the Australian citizens. I think that's very important that people recognize this and uh, so to make a good decision on the next election to kick out this uh, fascist government. When I say fascist government, many Australian people become upset, but you know, uh, it, that uh, doesn't creates, uh, you know, changes, you know, Australian government, definitely this government is a fascist government, it's a fascist culture. And Australian people should recognize this, you know, because they did, uh, you know, crime against humanity. There are documents and evidence about that. Can I just say I agree with you completely? Um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you some questions about what it was like in Manus, both initially when you were in detention and later when you were forced out of the camp. So can you tell us a little bit about the conditions in the camp uh, before you were forced out of the camp to East Lorengar? Yeah, you know, uh, we should look at the history of this prison. We have been here for more than uh, six years, you know, and now it's about seven years. So of course, you know, they are, you know, we should look at the history of this, you know. Uh, the first six months, they were treating us like in a way that now they are treating the, treating the refugees in Bomano prison with, uh, you know, starvation, with lack of food, lack of water, you know, and lack of, and they even didn't give us clothes, you know, uh, even they didn't give us, uh, you know, very simple thing like, uh, you know, a razor, you know. On that time, I remember for a while, they, you know, everyone in Manus, they had a very long view, you know. Uh, so it was like this, you know, they really, they were torturing us in, by depriving us to have access to very simple things that even in the worst prison, you know, you know the prisoners have uh, those things. So it was different. So after six months, I think I should uh, say that the history of this exile policy uh, is the first six months that it ended up in a riot and Reza Barat died, killed by the system. So that was the first time, first six months. Then after that, uh, the, the system started to give us simple things like food and you know this kind of thing. And uh, or. Uh, something like shampoo, enough shampoo, so something like this, razor. So after six months, so we, they started to do this, uh, and they brought a TV to the camp, and uh, just for two hours, you know, each night, you know, uh, we could have, uh, listen, we could listen to music, they gave us some MP3 player, but, you know, some very simple thing. So then, another part of the history of this Ibiza policy is that time uh, we did a very big hunger strike after.
after 18 months. So when we did that hunger strike, it was completely peaceful, completely peaceful. After 12 days, they attacked us and they arrested the leaders of the, you know, the protest, the hunger strike. And they uh, sent us to, uh, for, you know, prisoners in a prison called CIS. You know, I myself, I was in a Choka solitary confinement for four days. Then they sent me to that prison for 10 days. Then they sent me back to Choka for four, uh, two days. Then they sent me back to uh, another uh, isolation place called Charlie. I was there for 40 days. Then they sent me to a different town. You know, it was like this. So, and after that, you know, the important part of this history was uh, that time that the PNG Supreme Court ordered that uh, keeping people in prison is illegal. So after three years, exactly after three years, uh, we uh, could have access to phone, internet, and this kind of thing, you know? And so we could go out sometimes. But what they did, we too, getting in a bus, because the prison camp was located in a military you know, place. So we had to get in a bus and go to Lorenbo, you know, Lorenbo town, stay there for a few hours, then come back to the prison. So it was like a prison and the other side was not a prison, you know. They forced us to stay there. Well, they were targeting the refugees in Lorenbo town. So they created uh, fear and problem between the local people, local community and the refugees. And every day, the local people attacked the refugees because they were scared of the refugees. I think it was natural. What did the government do? Then after three years, we were... What yeah. did the government so do? After the, that's okay. What did the government do that made the locals scared of the refugees? Yeah, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, we should talk about the local people too, you know. They uh, told the local people, you know, later I did some research, they told me that they told them that these people that we are going to take to, uh, bring to Manus before they send us to Manus, they are criminals, they are dangerous, they are terrorist people. So you should be careful with them. But we want to keep them in this prison. They told them, you know. And what they told us about the local people, they say these people are uh, uncivilized people, they are white people, and even in this country you can see some, uh, you know, cannibals, you know. So they created this fear and they used that fear to control the local community because they were not happy with this uh, policy for the refugees. You know. Very unsafe and torture us inside the prison. So you, you know, so you didn't have the choice. You have to go back to your country. You know, so it was you know the. Uh, yeah, they, they, they were offering they were offering the Hingans from Myanmar twenty five thousand dollars in cash to go back to Myanmar with them. They they did with many people, and you know some uh, people from Syria went back, and even one of them injured. Someone from Iraq went back, and he injured. Uh, so uh, they one of the Vietnamese, you know, they were two beautiful men in Manus, you know, they were from Vietnam and they forced them and they sent them back. Unfortunately, he was killed. Just, uh, you know, I think it was close to the, Australia, the, the federal election, you know, so the media didn't talk about him, but he killed in uh, 
Vietnam. Uh, so very tragic stories, you know, very tragic stories uh, you, you can find here. So just I want to say, you know, uh, if we want to understand this uh, exile policy, we should look at the some main, uh, you know, period. Like the first six months that Reza Balati was killed, then the hunger strike, then the prison, uh, the uh, Supreme Court order, then the Good Friday when they attacked us by, you know, gun, and then during the siege on November 2017 that we were refused to go out and they left us for 23 days. Uh, then they forced people out. Then living in the community for about two years and they transferred us to Port Mosque. And still this system has control on us and still this political game continues. So, uh, you know, some people say that, oh, you are in prison and you are losing phone, you know? So, it's a very simple question. Well, now, there are many other things that I wanted to talk to you about, but I'm being told that it's time for us to get to let the audience ask some questions. But before, no. I, before I do that, I did want to ask you, um, the May election in Australia was a very surprise result with the dishonest hypocrite Scott Morrison becoming our Prime Minister again and Peter Dutton surviving and so on. Um, what impact did the result of the May election have on levels of self-harm amongst detainees in PNG? Yeah, you know, after the election, it was really a dark time. So a fascist system get power again. And so it was really hard because people, you know, like the Australian people, you know, everyone were, you know, expect that uh, so they were getting power and you know they announced in their uh, national conference before the election they announced in the national conference that if they get in power they will accept the new zealand offer you know so it was a big chance for us that we get out of this country this place uh, so but and many australian people i think you know were didn't expect that you know Boris Tom gets in power again. So, uh, so we were like others, you know. So when the election happened, so it was really hard, and so people started to, you know, self harm, and we had many every day, eight people, six people, four people, more than one hundred times, you know. You know, self harm and suicide attempt in two months. You know, in two months, more than 100 times that I myself recorded. You know, I myself recorded more than 100 times. So it was like this. You know, people just suddenly lost hope and uh, you know, no, collapsed. And I think, you know, you understand the situation. Even the Australian citizens, many people say that we want to move to New Zealand or other countries, you know, after the election. So just imagine some uh, forgotten people in a remote uh, island for six years that they uh, thought that, you know, if the neighbor gets in power, they will have this chance you know, get freedom. So it was terrible. Um, turning to a brighter subject, and I mean, I haven't had a chance to ask you about lots of aspects of the book, and if there are people in the audience who haven't read the book yet, I'm sure they will, um, because it's a very good book. 
Um, but it's so good that it won the Victorian Book Award and also the Victorian Premier's Award for Non-Fiction Literature, which is a sensational effort given the way you wrote it. So thank you for the conversation. We'll get people up now asking you questions and congratulations on such a dazzling book. Yeah.